Praise the Lord. Welcome to TOC Live Revival Service. But before we start, I want to pray for this nation, and I, I want to pray for God to move in a mighty way, not only in your life and here today, but also for this nation and this city. Father God, we pray right now for your peace to overcome us all, to take over this nation, this world, the government, and everything that's happening right now, God. Unite the body and unite this nation in one accord. In the name of Jesus, I pray for peace. I pray for justice, and I pray also for peace, and that we could all come together and understand that we are greater and better united together and working in peace. Father God, I ask for your love that surpasses all understanding to overtake us all, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. We are excited. We are going to do something different today, and I love when God invades our space and begin to do something different, radical, something we don't expect. And I know that's how he moves in a mighty way. Tonight, we don't have the worship team, but we have the spirit of worship in us. And we know that God is going to move through your worship as you are hearing the powerful word of God. So we're going to go straight to the word of God because we know that that's what the world needs today, the word of God. And I pray that today the word is going to be released, impacts your life, transforms you, touch you, gives you insight, revelation, and does what it was sent to do and does not return void. So, hey, tonight we have Pastor Len, our dear brother Pastor Len, and I know that God is going to use him in a mighty way. Praise the Lord. So I'm excited. Are you excited, TLC? Are you excited, Facebook Live? Amen. I know God is going to move in your life. Amen. So with further ado, I have Pastor Len here that he's going to release this prophetic work over your life. Come on. Give God a praise, if you will, right where hey. you are. Amen. He is able and he is awesome. Pastor Lang, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Good. God is good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm excited to give this word. And I know that you guys are excited to receive it. So I want to go ahead and get it started. I want to, I want to talk real quick. I've recently been uh, watching a, a documentary called The Last Dance. It's amazing. It's about Michael Jordan uh, and his last run with the Chicago Bulls. Incredible. It brought back nostalgic memories. I was a big Michael Jordan fan when I grew up. And I used to pattern my game after his, my work ethic. I tried to make it like his. And he was just, he was amazing to me. And I always knew he was tenacious. Michael Jordan would do whatever it took to win. He would do whatever it took for you to remember exactly who he was. Uh, one of the episodes he talks about a rookie scoring 37 points on him. And the rookie's team won. And Michael Jordan was upset. He made up this story. He fabricated a story that the rookie came up to him after the game, put his arm around him, and said, good game. So Jordan told his teammates and his friends that that's what happened. Come to find out, that didn't really happen. Jordan made up this, this, <laughs> this is how tenacious he was. He made up this scenario to give him extra motivation. He wanted to make sure that that kid never forgot who he was that Jordan was the greatest of all time. Kobe had the Mamba mentality. LeBron, he's kind of getting there. He don't really have the Mamba mentality, but Jordan's tenacity surpassed even that mentality that Kobe Bryant had. Because Jordan was on another level as far as tenacity was concerned. If you, if you gotta fabricate scenarios in your mind so that you can destroy people and they remember who you are, you, 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 you want something else. And that's what Jordan was on. And, and, and that scenario reminds me a lot about the love of Jesus. It's, it's weird how that works. But the love of Christ is so crazy. It's so tenacious. It's, it hunts you down. It comes after you. Jesus will do whatever it takes. He'll meet you where you are so that you can remember exactly who he is. Jesus is so gracious that he'll meet us where we are to give us a revelation of who he is. And so tonight, with that, with that fact in mind, I want you to come into the main text with me. It's John 20, 24 to 29. And it's talking about Thomas and the disciples. And I found something really interesting in the script that I'd like to share with you guys. If we can jump into the scriptures here, I'm going to go ahead and just read that. It's now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So Thomas was not with the rest of the disciples when Jesus came the first time. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands 
in the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Praise the Lord. That's the word of God. Jesus actually gives a, a, a blessing ahead of time for those who have not been able to walk with him, for those who, who would believe in him but did not get to embrace him in the physical, that did not get to see him in the physical. Jesus pronounces an extra blessing for those who are faithful. So in this text, Jesus reveals himself as the risen Lord to Thomas, who's in a spiritually distant state of unbelief and doubt. And tonight, we're going to cross-examine the gospel accounts and take a look at the disciples' reaction to the good news of Jesus' resurrection. And their reactions just surprised me. It was incredible how they reacted to seeing and hearing about the risen Lord. The most powerful truth in all the Gospels is received by doubt and unbelief by the very people who knew Jesus the most. I guess it isn't too shocking. 2,000 years later, and here we are. The truth of the Gospel is still yet met with doubt and unbelief. Why is this? As long as we believe in Jesus, there'll be a war going on in the heavenlies. There will always be a fight for our faith. There will always be a fight for our faith. In my line of work, I'm in and out of people's homes each day. Um, I, I travel from North Palm Beach to Vero Beach. I'm in about five to seven homes uh, in different communities each day. And there's so much uncertainty. People losing their businesses. People moving into new houses, but in the, in the process, they're losing their jobs. People getting furloughed, people getting laid off, people having family members that are sick. Not only in the church, in our communities, I'm hearing about this. Brothers reaching out to me, what's going on? There's so much uncertainty that I want to warn against doubt and unbelief. In our current times, there's a direct attack against the body of Christ. My God, I could preach about that all day, but I'm going to stick to the script. There's so much attacks against the body of Christ to spiritually distance the whole world from God. Listen to me. The devil is using this pandemic to separate the body of Christ, spiritually distancing believers from congregating with one another, trying to stop us from reaching non-believers. Ultimately, the devil is trying to use this pandemic to distance the world from salvation by spiritually distancing believers from God. Come on now. But how many know that not even the spread of this virus can stop the spread of the gospel? Not even the spread of the, come on now. This pandemic can't stop the good news of Jesus. And since the beginning in Genesis 3, we see the enemy sowing seeds of doubt that sprout into fear, shame, guilt, worry, and all types of other things. The objective of his very first sentence is recorded in the Bible to get Adam and Eve to doubt God. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of any tree? Has God indeed said? His very first sentence, trying to plant doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve. Now, we all know he was successful in this deception, and it created spiritual distancing between God and man. So my disclaimer for tonight is that I'm not a super Christian. <laughs> I'm a real Christian. And yes, I have doubted. Oh, I know. Things you don't... You <laughs> Things you might not hear a pastor say, yes, I have doubted, but I've used that very doubt to propel me deeper along in my faith walk with the Lord. Somebody out there got to hear this. If you're a super Christian, and maybe this word ain't for you, but if you're a real one, or if you don't know the Lord, I'd like you to come along with me on this journey tonight as we look to the first encounters of the risen Lord. First, Jesus meets Mary Magdalene in her weeping and heartache. This is right after he was crucified now. Earlier in John 20, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus to anoint his body with spices. And in Mark 16, Luke 24, Matthew 28, they each describe the other woman as going with her. And Jesus shows up to Mary in the midst of her weeping. Oh, because, come on, how many people know that Jesus will do whatever it takes to meet us where we are so that we can get a fresh revelation of who he is. Mary's the first person to encounter the risen Lord. 
Jesus reveals himself to Mary Magdalene first, back then in a time, in a culture, in a society where a woman's testimony was considered unreliable. Oh, culture said women were unreliable. Society told women, hmm, your words are suspect. Society told women that you're not to be trusted. Where the brave ladies at, though? Where the brave ladies at, though? Come on. How many of y'all know that Jesus knows a woman's worth? I said Jesus knows a woman's worth, and Jesus is such a gentleman. And he said ladies first. Yeah, he said ladies first. He chose women to be the first to spread the good news of the most powerful point of the gospel, that Jesus has risen. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. <laughs> he could have used a man, but, you know, maybe. He, I, men are short-winded. I mean, I don't know, man. <laughs> you might have got two words out of us. We would have been like, yo, he's back. Yo, my man, he's back. Yeah, he's back. Right? Because we, we short-winded. We, <laughs> but, but how many know that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he chose a woman to spread the good news that he is risen first? Oh, y'all don't hear me. Oh, see, when you, when you tell a woman to go tell it, she'll tell you all the deets. Ladies got all the details. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> Woo! He said, Mary, go tell him I'm back. She said, say no more. You know Mary had all the deets. She'll tell you who was there, who wasn't there, whose mama was there, whose sister was there, whose brother was there, whose cousin was there, what they had to eat, what they had in the Yeti cup to drink, and what the weather looked like. Come on, somebody. Somebody got to know that women got... Jesus knows your worth. Woo! Hallelujah. He is back. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Look, my wife preached in April for the first time ever. I know the Bible's true. How beautiful are the feet. My wife got some beautiful feet, man. She got some beautiful. I don't even like feet. I don't even like my own feet, but my wife got some beautiful feet. I know the Bible must be true. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. After Jesus' revelation to Mary, the Bible says... They fell at his feet in worship. Oh, come on. Because when you get that revelation of who he is, whoo, that's the posture that closes the gap of spiritual distancing between you and God. It's in your worship. Come on, somebody. I don't know what you're going through, but I hope you receive a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. In your worship, he shows up. In your worship, he shows himself strong. In your worship, whoo, that's when things start to get into their proper perspective. Sadness turns into joy when you worship. Weeping turns into wild and out when you worship. Come on, somebody. He reminds you of your worth, and he lets you know that the misconceptions people have about you, they get exposed for the very lies that they are when you worship. Hmm. Your storm looks a little different when you worship. Who told you you're not needed in the kingdom? Do you, do you understand what he did with Mary? Who said there's no place for you? Who told you your gifts are sufficient? Who lied to you? Who said you don't have anything to offer? The devil is a liar. Jesus changed Mary's life the very moment he met her. And then after he got crucified and came back and rose from the dead, she ultimately went from promiscuity and demon possession to when he first met her to becoming the plausible pioneer preacher of the risen Christ. That's the God that we serve. He'll meet you where you are to give you a fresh revelation of who he is. He so loves you that he wants to put eternity inside of your heart. Come on now. Mary runs to tell the disciples that she has seen the Lord. But what baffles me is what they say. Luke 24, 11 says the disciples thought her words seemed like idle tales. And they didn't believe them. Come on. I don't understand this. The, the disciples knew that Mary kept it real. Ever since that one time that Jesus, you know, he, he delivered her from seven, seven demons. You remember that one time? Mary always kept it real. She was always there for Jesus, yet the disciples still didn't believe her. She was, the Bible says she was amazed and she, was, she trembled and she was rejoicing. If they saw her in this state of excitement, how can you not believe something's going on here? Maybe she's telling the truth. How could the disciples still doubt her when, come on, they know she kept it real. She was faithful. The Bible says she contributed to Jesus' ministry. Some people don't even contribute to the ministry that they're in right now. How could they doubt her? Praise the Lord that Jesus has never given us a reason to doubt him. After this revelation to Mary, 
Jesus reveals himself to the, to the two disciples on Emmaus Road. And Jesus meets these two disciples in their sadness and despair. Luke 24, 15 to 17 says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. That's what Jesus does. He, he draws near. And their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And it said to them, Jesus says, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. They responded like, bro, are you the only one who doesn't know? Are you the only one who hasn't heard? They go on to explain how Jesus was condemned to death. And died uh, and crucified and how he was, they were hoping that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel. And at this point in time, their Messiah never looked so far away. Their Messiah never seemed so far away. And Jesus says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these, these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Hmm. And so Jesus starts to recite the word to them. The living word starts to recite the written word to them. I don't think y'all hear me. I said the living word starts to recite the living word. Oh, oh and the Bible says that their hearts started to burn within them. Woo! He's closing the gaps of spiritual distancing and unbelief in their hearts. Their hearts started to burn within them. Hopelessness is being burned away as the living word recites his living word. <sighs> oh, the Bible said he started to reveal some things concerning himself. It doesn't say exactly what he said, but starting with Moses and all the prophets, I think I got a good idea. He started to reveal the things concerning himself. Oh, he was like, let me brag on myself right quick. Let me let you know who he is. Jesus said, this, this, I'm a paraphrase, but I'm, I'm almost sure he says something like this. Have you not heard the Messiah will be born of a woman? Genesis 13, Genesis 3:15. Have you not heard the Messiah will be born of a virgin? Isaiah 7:14. Have you not heard the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem? Micah 5:2. The Messiah will come from the line of Abraham. Genesis 12:3. The Messiah will be a descendant of Isaac. Genesis 17:19. The Messiah will be a descendant of Jacob. Numbers 14:17. Have you not heard? He's, 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 he's slowly revealing the things concerning himself. Have you not heard? The Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah, for Genesis 49.10. The Messiah will be heir to King David's throne, Isaiah 9.7. The Messiah's throne will be anointed in eternal, Psalm 45.6.7. He's revealing the things concerning himself. The Messiah will be called Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah 7.14. Come on, somebody. He's revealing these things. Slowly, the scales are being removed from their eyes. The Messiah will be rejected by his own people, Psalm 69.8. The Messiah will be a prophet, Deuteronomy 18.15. Have you not heard? The Messiah will be preceded by Elijah, Malachi 4, 5, 6. The Messiah will, become, will be called a, a Nazarene, Isaiah 11, 1. He's revealing these things. He's, he said, and no wonder the Bible says that their hearts were burning within them. He wasn't done. He said, is it, written? it is written. The Messiah will be sent to heal the brokenhearted. Isaiah 61, 1 to 2. Slowly they are starting to remember. But the Messiah will be betrayed. Psalm 41, 9. The Messiah will be falsely accused. Psalm 35, 11. Have you forgotten? The Messiah will be crucified with criminals. Isaiah 53, 12. It is written. The Messiah's hands and feet will be pierced. The Messiah will be mocked and ridiculed. Psalm 22, 7, 8. Have you not heard? The Messiah will pray for his enemies. Psalm 109, 4. Oh, because when you hear the living word reciting the word of life, you can't walk around with a dead spirit. Something has to change. Hallelujah. Jesus said, let me go ahead and brag on myself right quick. Because Jesus will do whatever it takes. He'll meet you where you are in your sadness, in your grief, in your despair, in your hurting, in your pain, in your disobedience, and in your doubt. It doesn't matter. He'll do whatever it takes to give you a revelation of who he is. Because when you understand who he is, something has to change. Hallelujah. It goes on to say that they sat and broke bread with the bread of life, and then the bread of life broke out. <laughs> and Jesus disappeared before their eyes, and that's when, he, that's when he was recognized by the two disciples. Something happens when you break bread. Sounds like communion to me. Instantly they recognize him. All who commune with the Lord in his risen body by faith have their eyes open. He's most perfectly known in the breaking of the bread. And these two disciples, they're excited. Their hearts are burning within them. They've just broke bread with the bread of life himself, the risen Lord. They go back and tell the rest of the disciples. 
And Mark 16, 13 says, they did not believe them. This blows my mind. How could they still doubt Jesus? They knew he was miraculous. They knew he was supernatural. They knew he was mighty in word and deed, but they could not put the pieces together. See, they knew he had the hand of God on them, but they failed to recognize that he was God. Hmm. Then Jesus meets the rest of the disciples in their fear and grief. This is the first encounter with the rest of the disciples where Thomas is not with them. The Bible says that afterward he appeared to the disciples that were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Come on, man. All, all these different accounts, you're telling me you still don't believe? Have you not heard? Let me recite this. No, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> Have you not heard, really? It, it's, it's, it's so crazy that all of these different instances are happening because I see this time and time again where people are, are, are doubting the Lord. Believers are doubting the Lord, and, and, and they, they say they have faith, but their actions prove otherwise. How can, you not, how can you be in the presence of the risen king and still have doubts? Their hardness of heart got them rebuked by Jesus. It says he was upset because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. In this account where he shows up to the disciples, he walks through a locked door. And he says, why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts in your hearts? Because it starts in your heart, and when it travels to your head, oh, my gosh. He even goes on to show him his hands and show him his feet, but the Bible says they still did not believe. What? How do you, how do you, how? How do you not believe? What, what happened? Who lied to you? How do you not believe the Lord? And so often that happens to us every day. Many struggle with this time and time again. There's levels to this. The disciples had exhibited a kind of doubt that is experienced by believers who fail to accept the whole, finished, complete work of Jesus Christ. The Greek word for this type of doubt is called apostia, meaning disbelief. When the Bible speaks of being fully convinced in your faith, meaning you know that you know, the Greek word here is called pleirophoreo. Say that ten times fast. Pleirophoreo, meaning to most surely believe. What's interesting is the risen Christ doesn't show up to non-believers like the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the non-believing people in his hometown. Jesus shows up to believers who have bought the lie that Satan has won the victory. Jesus meets them in their weakness to set the record straight. How many know Jesus closes the gap of spiritual distance between us and God? Yeah, there's levels to this. See, there's another type of doubt that we see in the Bible. It's called oligopistos. And it's the combination of two Greek words, oligos meaning small, and pistis meaning faith. Oligopistos is the type of doubt that we hear, uh, hear about when Peter walks with Jesus. Hmm. Peter knows Jesus can make the winds and the waves obey him. He knows God is at work within him. But when he looks at the waves crashing, he fails to recognize that Jesus is God over the storms. Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus says, oh, you of illegal pistos, why did you doubt? I mean, because Peter is seen as the brave fisherman, right? He's the one who cut off the, the, high, servant, the high priest's servant's ear. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, just, he was, the, he was the, the scrappy one, the crazy one, right? But see, all it takes is a little distance between Peter and Jesus on that water. All it takes is a little distance between us and the Lord. All it takes is a little bit of distance for doubt to set in. See, doubt sprouts into something greater, and it starts to grow out of control until we can recognize exactly who Jesus is. Are you in awe of your storm, or are you in awe of the Lord? Are you in awe of your storm, what you're going through, or are you in awe of the risen Christ? Do you have a legal pistos? Where's my mask? How about, how about a, a, a apostia? I didn't bring my mask. I'm asking seriously, see, because Peter was asymptomatic. Some people are asymptomatic, see? Yeah, this means that they don't show signs. Oh, <laughs> y'all don't hear me. They don't show signs. It's only when the test comes that their faith is revealed. You got to hear me. 
Y'all don't hear me. Listen, listen, listen. What will the test re results reveal when we get that test back? When the test results come back, will they, will they reveal oligopistos or apostia? It's only when the test comes that your faith is revealed, and when the results come, your truth is exposed. This might mean a heart check for many who say, I don't doubt nothing. I don't fear nothing. <laughs> let, him, <laughs> let a roach crawl up your foot. <laughs> Tell me you don't fear nothing. <laughs> Sometimes we can fool ourselves, but it's in our worship that the Lord reveals the truth. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a super Christian, so I, I do have doubts every now and then, but I get right. The Lord is the one who pulls me in. He draws me in so that I can recognize who he is. See, it's one thing to recognize you have little faith and, 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 and say, you know what, Lord? I believe, but help my unbelief, right? It's a whole different thing to know you have little faith and be cool with it. I, I'm not, I, I can't do that. I can't. I, you can't have little faith and just be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm good. You got to cross over from being the victim to the victor at some point and receiving the word of God for the truth that it is. Come on, don't get it twisted. I'm not high risk, and your little faith ain't finna rub off on me. But I pray for you, but, but from afar. Until you're ready to let the Lord work in your heart and receive him as the, the risen Lord he is, he is God. I, <laughs> peace be with you, but I'm not finna be with you. <laughs> I, I gotta keep it moving. I learned from my, from my Messiah. And I'm asking this because I'm wondering, what great things have you robbed the world of because apostia has set into your home? Oh, my gosh. Because oligopistos has gone unaddressed. Has God called you to open a business? Has God called you to use your talents to not only bless you and your family with a greater income, but has he called you to use your talents to open a business, take a, take a, a, go ahead and on a faith walk so that you can have more time for ministry? Has he called you to write poetry? Has he called you to publish books? See, these are the type of things that we don't realize we are serving the God of the supernatural. Why are we limiting him? Oh, I need more confirmation. Nah, bro. Illegal pistos, bro. Apostia. Listen, I'm teaching Greek up in here. You got to call a spade a spade at some time. Thank God his character never changes. Thank God he remains faithful and he stays the same. He never switches up, but we do. My question is when Jesus' provision for your life looks different than what you expected, will you switch up? Will you all of a sudden have illegal pistos? When the provision of, of the Lord doesn't look exactly how you thought it would, what happens then? It's only when the test results are revealed that the truth gets exposed. See, the enemy is trying to get you to doubt God's promises, to doubt God's peace, to doubt God's provision and providence over your life. He's been a liar ever since the beginning. He's trying to get you to doubt God's protection. Has God really said he'll never leave you nor forsake you? Um, yes, he has, and I truly believe that in my heart. Has God really said? Has God really said? You do exceeding abundantly above it. Yes, yes, he did. Yes, the devil is a liar. He'll make it seem like, oh, but, but, but you've been praying, but your life looks like a mess. Where you at, though? Where's your God? Where you at, though? See, I wonder what kind of seeds of doubt were planted in you that ultimately made you go into hiding, spiritually distancing yourself from the body of believers. No wonder three in ten churches are shutting down nationwide. This attack on our world is satanic, and that's why we got to say his name, Jesus we got to say his name, Jesus. we got to say his name, Jesus, because when you say his name, something in the spiritual starts to happen. That doubt turns into faith, and it fuels you. you got to understand, when you say the name of Jesus, demons start to tremble. You might not see it, but in the spiritual realm, they're trembling because the name of Jesus holds power. Nowadays, we hear more talk about the second wave of COVID. We hear more talk about the second coming of COVID than we do of the second coming of Christ. Somebody got to hear me. But I believe my Lord is coming back and the sky's going to crack. I believe he's coming back on a white horse and all authority and power. I refuse to buy the lies of the enemy. He tries to shame us and tell us what we can and can't preach in our pulpits. You can't preach about the abundant life. There's people dying. People are sick. That would be insensitive. How dare you? No, my Bible says, <laughs> my Bible says that my God is a deliverer and ever-present help in times of trouble. My Bible says that reaping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. How dare the enemy try to think that the word of God will be filtered by the gates of hell? Come on, you got to understand what I'm telling you. 
I speak for every blood-bought believer in this world right now, every blood-bought believer in this world. When I say, devil, you can't dictate how blessed I am. You can't dictate my joy. It's a satanic attack against the pulpits of America. And the devil is a liar. So I come back to John 20, 24 to 29. It gives us a better picture and a better context of what's going on here. Make no mistake, I'm here to convince you that Jesus will do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to close the gap of spiritual distance between us and him. Jesus is so gracious that he'll meet us where we are to give us that revelation of who he is. Jesus meets Thomas in his unbelief and doubt. Come on, somebody, it's about to get real. Congregating cultivates culture. It's interesting that Thomas was absent in verse 24, which contributes to his sustained doubt. His absence caused seeds of doubt to cultivate in his heart for eight long days. Oh, this is crazy. The enemy loves when we're isolated because he knows that congregating cultivates the culture, the culture of faith. When we come together, it's uplifting. Truth can be heard when we congregate and come together. Where two or three are gathered, things start to change in the name of Jesus. Thomas wasn't with them. He needs more because he wasn't with them to believe. He says, I need to not only see him, but I need to touch him. See, it's almost like Thomas was saying, I don't know about y'all. Y'all eyes are deceiving you, so not only will I need to see, but I will need to touch him as well because y'all out here tripping. But see, we're not told why he wasn't there with them. But had he been there, he wouldn't have, have had to have gone through what verse 26 says, eight whole days of unbelief and doubt. Think about that. Eight whole days of doubting and unbelief. Eight days of doubts and hopelessness and despair. Eight days. Everybody else was cool. Thomas is out here tripping for eight days. Eight days of spiritual struggling and of hearing everybody else's accounts of seeing the risen Lord. Eight whole days of anguish. Imagine Imagine how he feels. I can imagine it probably turned into some sort of bitterness. Now, the Bible doesn't say that, but I can believe he was a little bit bitter. Like, think about this. Put yourself in Thomas's sandals. I can imagine Thomas is thinking, you know, of that one time when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. But, but, but he's probably doubting, though. He's probably reciting Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. But, but why, why isn't he close to me, though? I believe Thomas was kind of like, I, you know, I, I can't believe he's risen. Because if he is risen, that would mean he is God. And if, and, and if he is God, then he would know that, that my heart is broken. So why isn't he near to me? And maybe you can relate. God knows I lost my job. God knows my mother passed away. My uncle's sick. God knows. God knows I've been evicted. God knows I'm about to lose my house to sin foreclosure. God knows my marriage is in shambles. God knows I'm depressed and my retirement is gone. Where's God? I've lost hope. My bills are piling up. My career's in shambles. My, anxi my anxiety is sky high and I'm about to break down. Where is the, the God of, of my salvation? Where is this risen Lord? Think about it. The Bible doesn't say that, but, but think about how he's feeling. Mary Magdalene and all the other women, it says, saw Jesus. I mean, the, you know, the two disciples on the Maus Road saw Jesus, and they even got to break bread with him. Simon Peter, it says, saw Jesus after that. And then Jesus miraculously walked through locked doors and reveals himself to the rest of the disciples. He out here doing miracles for everybody else. Everyone else has hope, maybe, just maybe, Thomas is feeling spiritually distant from God. Oh, but Jesus is so gracious that he'll meet us where we are to give us a revelation of who he is. Come on, somebody. He'll meet us at our weakest point. He'll meet us at our lowest point. He'll meet us in our sin, our shame, and our doubt. He don't care. He will meet us to give us a revelation of who, we, who he really, really is. Oh, this is good. This is good. When we receive that revelation, something has to change. Something has to change. Jesus does the miraculous. He walks through that locked door. He walks right up to Thomas. He reveals his wounds, and he says, touch them. Do not unbelieve, but believe. 
Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Jesus meets Thomas in his unbelief and doubt, and he closes the gap of spiritual distancing between him and Thomas once and for all. And that leads to the clearest confession of Jesus Christ's divinity in all of Scripture. Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God. Oh, something happens in your spirit when you say, I don't know if you ever said that, but he said, my Lord and my God. Because that's who he is. He's my Lord and my God. It's so powerful when you recognize exactly who the Lord is. He's trying to do whatever it takes for them to see who they've been walking with this whole time. It's interesting, though, that in Matthew 28, 17, it says, they worship the risen Christ. Think about this. That's the posture. That's the answer. To worship the risen Christ, that's the answer. That's where his power is when his manifest presence becomes. Listen to me. They worship the the risen Christ. And as Jesus was given his great commission, they worship in him. He's given a great commission, and he ascends to the Father in heaven. But it says, but some doubted. What? But some doubted. Are you kidding me? That's when I recognize how dangerous doubt is. But when we have the posture of of, of Thomas and we say, my Lord and my God, we got to recognize that he is the God over our our situation. He is the God of of, of the situation that's making us uneasy and he wants us to lay down our burdens to him. See, we got to press in, and a lot of times doubt makes us run away, but we got to press into the Lord and worship the King of Kings. He's not only Lord, He is God, God over issues, God over problems, God and God alone. He is the only one worthy. He is God all by Himself. He don't need no help. He is God. Ultimately, when we're doubting, we're doubting His deity. Don't play with doubt. Mark 15, 1 says to repent and believe the gospel. That's, That's it. Don't play with doubt. Shake off every weight of sin, including doubt. He knows what makes you sick. He knows what makes you tick. He knows every strand of hair on your head. He cares for you, and he wants you to press into him. He wants you to invite him in so that he can give you a revelation of who he is. He'll walk on the waves of the water. He'll walk right up through the walls, and and he'll walk in that locked door and reveal his wounds to you so you can get a fresh revelation of exactly who he is. He calms the waves of depression. He rebukes the winds of worry. He makes fear bow in his presence. Demons are subject to his name and authority. He is God. When Jesus walks into the room, something has to change. Just press into him, press into him, press into his manifest presence. He loves you. He cares for you. He needs you to recognize who he is so that these things don't overtake you. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, Matthew 29, 11. And I just want to say today, if you don't know the Lord, what does this all mean for you? Well, the Bible says in Luke 19, 10, Jesus came to save, to seek. He's, he's looking for He came to seek and to save the lost. That's right. He'll meet you exactly where you are. So I pray this blessed you tonight. I thank you guys for giving me this time. I know I probably went a little over, got a little excited, but that's what we do here, amen. This is, this is still the, the, the most incredible house of worship. I'm blessed to be able to give this message, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you receive the Lord. I just want to say I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't stop until I give a call for salvation. I'm only up here because I responded to a call like that in my life. So I want to pray right now for anyone who's like, you know what? I think I'm going to trust the Lord. I think I'm going to just do what it do and, and go ahead and see what God has for me and be all the way in. So if, tonight, if that's you, thank you. God bless you. I'm ready to rejoice with you. We can see we're in uncertain times and so much things going on around us politically and, 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 and health-wise. And, and there's so much uncertainty. Trust in the Lord. That is the only thing that will give you Certain peace in your life is the peace that, was, that transcends all understanding. So let's go ahead and pray. You ready? You ready to take this walk of faith? Let's do this. Say, Father God, thank you for your son Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. 
I believe your, your one and only son, Jesus Christ, paid the price for me to be saved. I believe by faith that he is God, God over my issue, God over my circumstances. He is God and God alone and God is worthy to be worshiped. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would receive me into the kingdom of heaven. Let your will be done in me and through me. Write my name in the book of life and have your way in everything that I do, Lord. May you be worshiped. May you be lifted up and lifted high. I surrender my life to you tonight. Father God, I thank you. Lord Jesus, I love you. Go ahead and go to work in me, Holy Spirit. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Be blessed. I love you. Amen. Amen. What a powerful word from Pastor Len. I don't know about you, but wow, that was deep. That was powerful. That was so profound. Amen. Social distancing. Hallelujah. Spiritual distancing and all that. It's just amazing. I pray that God will continue to use him in a mighty way. We are so excited to see what the Lord has done in your life today through that powerful word. Receive it. Hallelujah. Apply it. Amen. And move in peace and in faith. Amen. This is the Outside Church. And thank you so much for connecting with us tonight, today. Share the video. Amen. Be blessed. Amen. Share this with your family. Amen. Do Bible studies with it. I know it's going to be powerful throughout the week what the Lord has revealed to you today. I pray over the life of Pastor Len and all of you guys that have connected with us today. Amen. May the Lord continue to bless you and prosper you. And, and if you have given your life to the Lord, just connect yourself with a church nearby. Amen. So you can bear fruits of salvation and what the Lord has done in your life. And if you want to continue to bless this ministry, amen, go ahead. You know what you need to do. Those who are sons and daughters of, of the outside church, and go ahead and bless the Lord. He will prosper you and continue to bless you as well. Thank you and God bless you. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord.